There are two things I want to make clear in this video. The first is that I am not a Darwinist, and the second is that I think Darwin was wrong. Both these points need clarification, however. When I say I'm not a Darwinist, what I specifically mean is that I don't believe that everything Darwin wrote in The Origin of Species is correct. And when I say I think that Darwin was wrong, I mean that while I agree with many of his conclusions as to the mechanisms of evolution and their consequences, there is at least one point on which he is unambiguously wrong. Well, those two claims are disappointingly pedestrian now that I've explained them, so why am I quibbling with Darwin? Well, because one of the tactics that I've noticed from creationists recently is the argument that believing in Darwin is just like a religious belief. Ben Stein, in his film Expelled, refers to an orthodoxy of Darwinism. The Discovery Institute are also keen to present Darwin's explanation of evolution as an article of faith. Despite this attempt to portray the theory of evolution as rigid dogma, for anyone who works as a scientist, this approach is patently untrue. To demonstrate this, let us first look at Sir Isaac Newton. Newton was perhaps the world's foremost mind at a time when science was beginning to realise its full potential. He developed calculus, provided a theory of gravity which explained planetary motion, and also appears to have been a rather unpleasant person. Now, let us consider his laws of motion. Specifically, his second law, which is still taught in schools today, is F equals MA. Now, this works pretty well for anyone travelling at relative speeds less than that of, say, a supersonic jet. However, once the speed of light starts getting close, relativistic effects start to play a significant role, and a more complex law has to be applied. We could argue semantics here and say that Newton's second law is just incomplete, but back a physicist into a corner and he will grudgingly admit that as the speed of light is approached, Newton's second law is wrong. This of course does not damage the reputation of Sir Isaac Newton. His theories become modified, but are still accepted as the correct foundation, even though it is wrong in detail. Anybody wishing to prove Newton fundamentally wrong will almost certainly be met with scepticism, but eventually consensus will go to where the evidence points. Newton is but a man after all, and no matter how profound his insights were, he is not immune from error. The approach of the biblical literalist, on the other hand, cannot contemplate the fallibility of its messengers. Consider this example from the book of Matthew, chapter 24. The disciples of Jesus ask him to tell of the impending destruction of the temple and the end of the world. Jesus tells them of both, gives the signs that herald them, and then says, This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. A first reading of this passage gives the impression that of the people he is talking to, some will still be alive when the last days arrive. How does the literalist deal with the fact that the world has not ended yet? Well, there are several ways that I'm aware of. Some say that Jesus is referring only to the destruction of the temple when he makes that statement, and the fact that it looks otherwise is merely to do with modern oratory conventions. Another is that the original word has been mistranslated as generation rather than race, which in this case would mean the Jews. Another approach is to say that the generation which sees the portents of the end of times shall not pass away before the end of times actually comes. The point here is not to debate the meaning of Matthew 24, but rather to examine the approach the literalist takes. Jesus could not have been wrong, so it is our interpretation of his words that must be called into question. In scientific terms, Jesus is given the status of objective, independently verified data. Jesus is not just a man, after all, and no matter how profound his insights are, these would be called into question were he not immune from error. These two different approaches typify the difference between the scientific method and a dogmatic approach to religion. So, how do scientists treat Darwin? Let's look at the Tree of Life, one of the most important elements of Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. According to this theory, once a speciation event occurs, the two populations no longer interbreed and branch off into different directions. 
On a macroscopic level, this appears to be true, and DNA has provided powerful support for this case. If, however, we look on a microbial level, genetic information seems to occasionally be shared across species. So much so, in fact, that horizontal gene transfer seems to be at least as important a factor as genetic mutation. For microbial life, Darwin's tree has become a web, or at best a very confused river delta. What's more, one of the single most important evolutionary developments in life's history is as a result of two branches joining back up. Current theory holds that two early prokaryotic cells, one archaeal, the other bacterial, fused to form the first eukaryotic cell. This is the type of cell found in most multicellular life, including all plants, animals and fungi. This important part of the tree of life is in fact a loop. On top of this there is also evidence of occasional horizontal gene transfer in the animal kingdom, although this is quite rare, but there is some really interesting research being done in the roles viruses play in this. So, Darwin was wrong. Does this mean that Darwinian evolution is dead? No more so than Newtonian physics. Some of the details may have been altered and some generalizations may have been exposed as oversimplistic, but the guiding ideas remained and are in fact stronger than ever after more than a century of corroborative evidence. Let us recap on our approaches to Darwin, Newton and Jesus. Darwin's tree of life fails at microbial level, and those who work in the field agree that he was wrong on this point. Newton's laws of motion fail as they approach the speed of light, and again, physicists agree that Newton was wrong in these cases. Jesus' foretelling of the end of days appears not to have happened as predicted, but apologists insist that Jesus was not wrong, merely our interpretation of him. This is the essential difference between the scientific and religious approaches. The religious approach can allow no fallibility on the part of its prophets, whereas science thrives on the perfecting of its theories. The only reason that the scientific community is so immovable on the point of common ancestry is that there is so much data to back up the claim. Any thought that it is born of some sort of religious reverence for Darwin is, as I have shown, wrong. Similarly, any thought that the fact that Darwin overstated the application of his tree of life brings into question evolution as a whole is false. Evolution is about science, not about Darwin.